Welcome back to Tolkien Adaptation Month, and welcome back to a look at Tolkien on radio. Dave's Obsession, Dave's Obsession of the Moment. In year one of Tolkien Adaptation Month, I talked about my favorite adaptation of The Hobbit, the 1968 BBC radio dramatization. I mentioned that it is not the only radio dramatization of Tolkien, and that maybe I'd talk about the others another time. And oh look, it's another time. Yes, Middle-earth was long thought to be unfilmable, and many of the attempts to prove the contrary, uh, didn't. So many adapters thought the best format to bring Tolkien's work to life was audio. There are a couple of foreign language radio adaptations I won't be going into today because I don't speak those languages and I would not have much to say about them. I was lucky to find all the foreign TV adaptations with English subtitles. I am not so lucky with radio plays. I'm also not covering audiobooks or any other one-man audio productions. To count as a radio play, the script needs to be adapted and there needs to be a cast of performers. I am, however, going to start by talking about a production I've never actually heard. Yes, we are attempting to talk about not only the first attempt to adapt Lord of the Rings to radio, but as far as we know, the first attempt to adapt Lord of the Rings into any other medium. This was a 1955 BBC production, which is lost to the ages, like so many BBC productions. For a long time, all we knew about this was the cast and the crew, and what Tolkien wrote in his letters. He was, uh, not a fan. I think the book quite unsuitable for dramatization and have not enjoyed the broadcasts, though they have improved. I thought Tom Bombadil dreadful. Okay, speaking as the director of the most prominent English language visual depiction of Bombadil as far as I know, I really want to hear what was so dreadful about this radio depiction. But worse still was the announcer's preliminary remarks that Goldberry was his daughter, and that Willowman was an ally of Mordor. Cannot people imagine things hostile to men and hobbits who prey on them without being in league with the devil? Okay, in their defense, you yourself heavily implied that all evil in Middle-earth was doing Mordor's work, even when it thought it was working for itself so you gotta cut the adapter some slack there, tallers. And for a long time, we assumed that was all we would ever know. But then it turned out that not only had the scripts for the radio show survived, but several previously unknown correspondences between Tolkien and producer Terence Tiller had also survived. These are all in the BBC archives, and they have not, as of this recording, been released to the public for just any old one to read but a writer named Stuart D. Lee was granted access to these items. So most of the information I currently have about this broadcast comes from an essay Lee wrote for this book, which is a collection of essays about Tolkien's work published in honor of Christopher Tolkien. This essay doesn't really have anything to do with Christopher. I guess when you devote your life to finishing your father's work, even in death you can't really get out of his shadow. Tolkien and Tiller actually corresponded quite a bit during the development of the scripts. Tolkien acknowledged that it would make sense to cut the songs, and he had some other notes on adaptation, but unsurprisingly, most of his notes were linguistic in nature. He had very specific opinions about what sort of accents and dialects made sense for which of the folks of Middle-earth, because this entire legendarium exists to support his fake language. His real language, but his man-made language for elves. The original plan was for every episode to be 45 minutes each, but by the time the scripts were written, the decision was made to cut them down to 30 minutes each, which, needless to say, required condensing the story even more drastically than was already expected. But Tiller sent the scripts to Tolkien for final approval, with a note that includes those magical words every author wants to hear, I hope that the themes of your work have not been totally obscured or mutilated beyond reason. And Tolkien responded with a resounding, approving, I do not think with the time at your disposal you could have done any better. I'm virtually bursting with that aquatulence. From the sounds of things, it seems like most of what was cut was the world building, the texture that gives Middle-earth its feeling of rich history and adds weight to the events of the story. And without those details, the story was basically functional, but far more fairy tale ish Tolkien himself acknowledged in his correspondence that, quote, a weakness of the books is the necessity of historical buildup concurrent with the tale of the events. So between that, his backhanded approval under unfortunate conditions here, and his later dismissal of elements of the show as dreadful, it seems like he was just resigned at this point to never actually enjoying an adaptation of his work, whether he approved of it or not. 
but he gave a few script notes, some of them were implemented, and production began. Tolkien himself was invited to the rehearsals, but he opted not to attend. Probably because, again, he knew he wouldn't enjoy it and didn't want to just sit there stewing. Episode 1 aired on November 14th, 1955, which is impressive considering that's less than a month after Return of the King was first published. Which means if you're watching this the day it premieres, the 68th anniversary of the first episode is in two days. Today as you're watching this is of course the 68th anniversary of the Hill Valley Lightning Storm, but that's a different trilogy. Tomorrow's my third wedding anniversary. I should uh, probably make a dinner reservation. The cast is full of character actors of varying degrees of notoriety. The two members of the cast who stood out most to me are two people who wouldn't have been particularly well known at the time, who play two Gondor characters who rarely ever make it into adaptations at all. Two unknown actors playing two unknown characters? How could that be interesting, you ask? Let me tell you. Bergil, the 10-year-old son of Baragond, was played by a 15-year-old David Hemmings. And Yorith, the babbling old nurse in the Houses of Healing, a 24-year-old Prunella Scales. That's right, before Jack and Ori cast Mr. Hutchinson as Bilbo, before Cronidaly had fake Basil Fawlty as Barlam and Butterbur, this production had Sybil Fawlty in the Houses of Healing. You cannot abide cruelty to living creatures. Well, I'm a creature, you can abide it to me. You're not living. Episode 1 was called The Meaning of the Ring, and according to the summaries in this book, it summarized concerning hobbits and the hobbit, then breezed through the first two chapters of book 1. The party may have been long expected, but it was short-lived. Episode 2 was called Black Riders and Others, which is such a funny name to me. It's the Black Riders and Friends show. Black Riders and the rest. Episode 2 breezes through the sale of Bag End, the first Nazgul encounter, Gildor, Farmer Maggot, Conspiracy Unmasked, Old Man Willow, and the House of Tom Bombadil. Episode 3 is called Aragorn, and it covers the Barrow Downs, the Prancing Pony, the Meeting of Strider, Weathertop, Glorfindel, and the Flight to the Ford. Episode 4 was Many Meetings, and it starts with Frodo awakening in Rivendell and goes all the way to him deciding to take the ring at the Council of Elrond. Episode 5, The Moria Gate, covers the forming of the Fellowship, the failed journey over Caradhras, the Warg attack, the Watcher in the Water, and the journey through Moria, though without the Chamber of Records, concluding with the Bridge of Khazad Doom. Finally, Episode 6, The Breaking of the Fellowship, covers Lothlorien, the Mirror of Galadriel, and the Gifts of Galadriel, Legolas shooting the Flying Nazgul, Boromir's attempts to take the ring, and Frodo and Sam's departure on their own. Six 30-minute episodes, all of Fellowship of the Ring, except for the parts that were cut. And that's series one, and although I haven't read the scripts myself, from the summaries I've read, it sounds like compressing all of Fellowship into six 30-minute episodes left everything feeling pretty rushed. So there's no way they continued like this, right? There's no way they covered Two Towers and Return of the King with six 30-minute episodes each, right? Of course not. They covered Two Towers and Return of the King with six 30-minute episodes total. Yep, the BBC only greenlit one more series to wrap up the adaptation, and Tiller reluctantly decided that rushing through the finish was better than pulling what would later be known as a Bakshi and leaving it unfinished, or pulling what would later be known as a Rankin Bass and leaving it unstarted. So Tiller once again sent the scripts to Tolkien, and Tolkien once again acknowledged that Tiller had done his best, but he asked, quote, why this sort of treatment was allowed. What gives, what, what gives you the right? Is it irony to illustrate criticism of a BBC decision with a clip from an NBC remake of a BBC show? So series 2 episode 1 was called Fangorn, and it starts with Boromir's death without his final dialogue. Then it breezes through the hunt for Merry and Pippin, the riders of Rohan, the hobbits escape to meet Treebeard, an uncharacteristically hasty Entmoot, and Gandalf's return. Episode 2 is called Rohan and Isengard, and it starts with the crew arriving in Edoras, and then apparently the freeing of Theoden's mind all the way to the conclusion of the Battle of Helm's Deep is covered in two script pages. Then the crew reunites with the hobbits in Isengard, have their exchange with Saruman, Pippin looks into the Palantir, and Aragorn takes the Palantir. All of book three covered in two episodes. Episode three is called Into the Dark, and it's... All of Book 4, Frodo, Sam, Gollum, Faramir, Shelob, Frodo's capture, all condensed into 30 minutes. Episode 4 is called The Siege of Gondor, and it's 
not quite all of Book 5, but basically everything up to the point when the Rohirrim arrive at Pelennor Fields. Episode 5 is called Minas Tirith and Mount Doom, and it starts with Theoden's death, then rushes through the end of the battle, the Houses of Healing, the encounter with the Mouth of Sauron, and then the battle outside the Black Gate. And then, eight pages into the script, the action returns to Sam, who rescues Frodo, and it goes all the way to the arrival at Mount Doom, with Gollum's death and the ring's destruction apparently covered in less than a minute, and Frodo says he's glad Sam's with him here at the end of all things. The sixth and final episode is called Many Partings, and Sam wakes up in Gondor, Aragorn is crowned, the couples are married, the hobbits journey home, they meet Treebeard and Butterbur on the way, and a full five pages of the script are dedicated to the scouring of the Shire, because even this slash and burn approach to adaptation knows how essential the scouring is, Sam marries Rosie, Frodo goes to the Grey Havens, well, I'm back, the end. And that's how it was adapted, and despite his claims elsewhere about not enjoying the broadcasts, Tolkien actually had some kind things to say to Tiller in the wake of the first series, complimenting him on the depiction of the elves and the Council of Elrond in particular. He even defended the production against some other people's criticisms. Notably, some critics apparently thought the Hobbit's voices should sound squeaky, to which Tolkien asked, why should tones rise with fall in stature? Tolkien did not think the Hobbits were part of the High Voice crew. Your voice is high all the time! Series 1 got mixed but mostly positive reviews, but the extra condensed Series 2 was received a bit more negatively, with readers of the books left frustrated at the watering down of the story, and non-readers of the books left confused. This is a trend in a lot of Tolkien adaptations. It's a miracle people could follow the Jackson movies. So this wasn't Tolkien's bag, and that's fair. I can't judge it for myself because I've never heard it and probably never will. But, you know, for years the 68 BBC Hobbit was also thought to be lost, so if a recording of this somehow ever resurfaces, or even if the scripts are ever released publicly, I may revisit this topic in the future. But for now, it's time to come back to my side of the pond for the work of Mind's Eye Productions, aka the ones that came in those wooden crates. Yes, 11 years after the BBC Hobbit radio adaptation, an American group tackled both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings for broadcast on NPR. I have not been able to find the exact broadcast dates for these shows. I don't even know for a fact which order they played in, but I will cover The Hobbit first because that's the story that comes first, whether or not the broadcast did. In a hole in the ground there lived... A Hobbit. Okay, Oliphant in the room. This thing is fighting an uphill battle with me when I already think The Hobbit was adapted to radio almost perfectly. So I'm going to start with some positive notes about this version. It is nice that this adaptation includes parts that the BBC radio version glossed over. Sure, it still doesn't include Chip the Glasses Crack the Plates or the Trolls Talking Purse, but it actually dramatizes the dwarves showing up 2x2 two two to Bayorn's lodgings, and it dramatizes Bombor falling into the Enchanted River instead of just breezing through them both in narration the way the BBC show did. Uh, careful, Bombor, or you'll swamp the boat. I will! Bombor's fallen in! He'll drown! Bring him in. Throw him the rope. And this version does include Bilbo coming home to find an auction at Bag End, but that pretty much is covered in narration. He had arrived back in the middle of an auction in which the effects of the late Bilbo Baggins Esquire of Bag End, Underhill, Hobbiton, were being disposed of by Bilbo's cousins, the Sackville Bagginses. But since the 68 version admitted that entirely, it's nice to hear that particular comic beat... addressed. By my math, we should have gotten another radio version in 1990 that acted out the auction, but only described Chip the Glasses. But if we did get one, its memory is lost to the ages. But other than those handful of omissions that either one or both made, both of these adaptations are pretty faithful, so the biggest differences come in delivery. Where are you going? What about a little light? We like the dark. Dark for dark business. See, that's almost as iconic as it is in the BBC version. We like the dark. 
dark for dark business. Ray Reinhardt is Bilbo and... Uh, just what I say. And please don't cook me, kind sirs. I'm a good cook myself and cook better than I cook, if you see what I mean. He's fine. Bilbo is fine in this. It's not his fault that Paul Damon's Bilbo in the earlier radio show was exquisite. Please don't cook me, kind sirs. I, I, I'm a very good cook myself, you know. And I, I, I cook better than I cook. <laughs> if, you see what, <clears throat> if you see what I mean. Tom Luce is Thorin and... We are met to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. We shall soon, before the break of day, start on our long journey... A journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us, may never return. He kind of sounds like Orson Welles trying to do John Wayne mixed with Jimmy Stewart, but accidentally dipping into Paul Lind. But he's fine. Now what? Somebody's banging with a stick. <laughs> carefully, carefully. Not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat and then open the door like a pop gun. That was the sound of the door opening like a pop gun? Those are some gently tumbling dwarves. Then again, we don't know what pop guns in Middle Earth are like, since we don't know what guns in Middle Earth are like. Huh. I've said there's never been a bad version of Misty Mountain's Cold, and I'm not quite ready to label this version bad, but this is probably my least favorite I've heard. I give them credit for doing more of the verses than the BBC did, even if they still don't cover all of them, and they change a word inexplicably. And screeching to a complete halt between each stanza seems... unnecessary? Okay, what I'm about to say is probably completely inaccessible to everyone who didn't grow up Episcopalian, but... This feels like when the season changes and suddenly all the hymns are to a different tune. The lyrics are still familiar, but the music feels... off. Okay, so let's compare the finding of the ring in both these radio versions. Here's the 68 BBC version. Still, I guessed as well as I could, and I crawled along for a good way, until suddenly my hand met on the floor of the tunnel what felt like a little tiny ring of cold metal. It was a turning point in the Hobbit's career. Not that he knew it at the time. He put the ring in his pocket almost without thinking. And here's the 79 NPR version. He crawled along for a good way till suddenly his hand met what felt like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. It feels like a ring. Hmm. Well, I'll just put it in my pocket. It's like... There's nothing wrong with it. It gets the point across. It just isn't infused with the same level of emotion. It's like a solid A minus. The biggest thing this production gets right that my beloved BBC production gets wrong, the pronunciation of Gollum. A slimy creature called Gollum watched him from a tiny rock island in the middle of the lake. They get some other pronunciations wrong, but I'm trying to focus on the positive here. And it's hard to tell from the performance, but... It sounds like this is yet another adaptation that has Bilbo deliberately ask a non-riddle. Uh, uh, what have I got in my pocket? <laughs> Are there more adaptations that get this wrong than get it right? It's weird. 
They also skip the pity that stays Bilbo's hand, but at least they paint a more accurate picture of his nerves in escaping than the smug taunting of Rankin Bass or Soviet Hobbit. Bilbo almost stopped breathing and went stiff himself. He was desperate. He must get away out of this horrible darkness while he had any strength left. He trembled. And then, quite suddenly, in a flash, as if lifted by a new strength and resolve, he leaped straight over Gollum's head. Gollum threw himself backwards and grabbed as the hobbit flew over him, but too late. His hands snapped on thin air, and Bilbo, falling fair on his sturdy feet, sped off down the tunnel. I will say, I still like this better than any of the filmed adaptations of The Hobbit. Any of the finished ones, anyway. That didn't just film actors reciting. If I had heard this before I heard the BBC one, I would have had very few criticisms. Even though I think I still would have liked that version better once I heard it. I know it's not fair to judge a piece of media based on what it's not, rather than what it is. And this is good. It just was already done even better and I heard the better version first. There's a lot of moments I liked in this one, but even then, more often than not, the most positive thought I had was, this scene is almost as good here as it is in the really good one. And the problem is, this adaptation isn't different enough from the earlier adaptation for me to enjoy it distinctly on its own without comparison. If this had a real unique take on any of the scenes or characters, I could potentially appreciate both as distinct versions, the way I can appreciate things from the numerous filmed adaptations of Tolkien. But unfortunately, this is trying the same basic thing as the earlier adaptation, and at its best, it's almost as good. Now all that said, it actually is really nice to hear a version of The Hobbit adapted by the same team that adapted Lord of the Rings that still keeps the proper tone for The Hobbit. Speaking of which, let's hear how they adapted Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Like their take on The Hobbit, the Mind's Eye production of Lord of the Rings is a decently faithful adaptation of the text, only really condensing and abridging things for time, but unlike their Hobbit, this didn't come after an excellent radio adaptation of the same source material, at least as far as we know since we haven't heard the 55 version, but from what we hear it doesn't sound like it was excellent, so this did not begin its life in another production shadow. Frodo is voiced by James Arrington, whose most prominent voice role is this guy. Oh. Oh, no, no. Oh, yes. I mean, oh, no, no, madam. <laughs> Everything will be p perfect. <laughs> and his take on Frodo... You look the same as ever, Frodo. <laughs> so do you. Uh, maybe a bit older and more careworn. Still... Tell me news of yourself, and of the wide world. Maybe my brain has been poisoned by too many obsessions of too many moments, but... Is it just me, or does he sound kinda like Guybrush Threepwood? The ring you say is dangerous? In what way? LeChuck's ring had a terrible curse on it, but I put everything right. You're safe, and everything's gonna be fine. This Frodo sounds more like Guybrush than the Frodo who was actually voiced by Dominic Armato. My errand awaits. What a pity that Bilbo didn't stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. The audience didn't hear it, but trust us, it was pity. So you have come, Gandalf. Yes, I have come for your aid, Saruman the White. James Arrington also plays Saruman, and the role is a little more... Arch? Have you indeed, Gandalf the Grey, for aid? Yes, yes. It has seldom been heard of that Gandalf the Grey sought for aid, one so cunning and so wise. I'm sure this is at least partially an attempt to distinguish the voice from Frodo's, but it's just so... sinister cartoon bad guy. I don't feel any magical persuasiveness in this Saruman's voice. But what has one of the big people got to do with us? A lot of the hobbits and the elves are voiced by women, which I'm fine with because there weren't that many roles for them in the story, but it seems to be an attempt to make them sound diminutive or fair, and uh, I don't know how well it works. And what is he doing in this part of the world? I'm begging your pardon, I know where he comes from. Where? It's from Hobbiton that this black rider comes from. I guess these producers thought only some tone should rise with the fallen stature. I can hear far side tales and children's stories at home, some Ganji, if I want to. <laughs> still, still I do hear queer things these days, to be sure. Ah? Uh? Who invented the stories anyway? Take 
dragons now. Uh, uh, no thanks, I won't. Sam is voiced by the legendary Lou Bliss, aka all these characters, and Sam's not really given much of an introduction. He is mentioned by the gaffer, but then he just shows up arguing with Sandy Man, and we start following him until he hides outside Bag End dropping eaves. Mr. Frodo, sir, uh, don't let him hurt me. I heard a deal that I didn't understand. I know his introduction's not that much more in-depth in the book, but like the way narration works in the book, we actually feel the weight that we're meeting an important character. And like, we know Sam because we know this story, but if this was your first exposure to the story, the introductions might feel a bit unfocused. Master Elrond, believe not that in the land of Gondor, the blood of Numenor is spent, nor all its pride and dignity forgotten. The actor who played both Boromir and Theoden here would go on to be the voice of Admiral Akbar. Mm, I greet you, uh, and maybe you look for welcome, but truth to tell, your welcome is doubtful here, Master Gondor. Insert joke here about Boromir's greed or Grima's counsel being a trap. Unlike the six hours total of the 55 production, this version got 11 hours, giving it breathing room to be mostly coherent in its adaptation. Still rushed at points, but like it mostly makes sense. Mostly. But I've heard something that's made me anxious and needs looking into. I think you should get off at once. Oh. Okay, so unlike in the book where Gandalf is urgent, but he's still okay with Frodo planning his leaving methodically, here he just says Frodo should be off at once, much like Jackson would later have him do. But Bilbo's birthday came and went and still Gandalf did not return. So Frodo didn't exactly go off at once then. This is the problem when you just take some phrases from the book verbatim without thinking about how they're affected by the parts you did change. Unlike Ralph Bakshi the earlier year, this version includes Gildor. Tonight, Frodo, you will lodge with us if you will. Oh, thank you indeed, Gildor. A star shines on the hour of our meeting, as you say in High Elven speech. This is good fortune beyond my hope. And it includes Farmer Maggot. Baggins is coming, he hissed at me. Oh. I wish to find him. If he passes, will you tell me? I'll come back with gold. <laughs> no, no, you won't, I said. And yes, it's got Tom Bombadil, baby. If my friends are caught in the willow tree. Master what? Mary's being squeezed in a crack. Oh, yes, oh hell. Old man Willow, not worse than that. I know the tune for him, old gray willow man. I'll freeze his marrow cold, I'll sing his roots off, I'll just put my mouth to the crack. While basically every adaptational choice is made more in the name of abridgment than in the name of creative decisions, some of those abridgments actually do recontextualize moments of the story. Like Farmer Maggot, the way his episode episode is condensed leaves it kind of ambiguous as to whether or not Maggot actually remembers Frodo from his youth or not, until the ending, which makes it much more of a punchline. And Mr. Frodo, Mrs. Maggot put this up for Mr. Baggins, with her compliment. For, for me? <laughs> oh, a basket of mushrooms. Well, I never, you remembered me after all. <laughs> Sure, it's not the melancholy of Book Frodo realizing he lost a chance at a great friendship, but as far as ways to condense Maggot go, I will take it over what Jackson did. Sam, it doesn't seem as if I can trust anyone. Well, after all, sir, Gandalf did say, take someone as you can trust. Yeah, those lines made more sense in the order they were in in the book. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Um, Underhill. If old Butterbur got your name right. Okay, so decades before Jackson turned Thor and Oakenshield into Aragorn Light, Mind's Eye just had the same actor play both Aragorn and Thor and Oakenshield. There are some moments in the book that are, for lack of a better word, visual, like the shadow that passes between Frodo and Bilbo turning him into a little wrinkled creature with a hungry face and bony groping hands. Moments like these could be dealt with in narration, but in this particular case... I should like very much to peep at it again. Yes, I've got it. it. Looks the same as it always did. Here, if you must. But no, why should I? I I'm sorry, put it away. Don't adventures ever have an end? You could also just make it completely innocuous on Frodo's part. Just like a casual changing of the mind, not actually a big emotional beat about the power of the ring. 
It's funny how both this version and Jackson's version completely rush that moment, but in opposite directions. This might be the only adaptation I've experienced to do all the scenes from the books in the order they're presented in the books. They do all of book three, The Treason of Isengard, and then they do all of book four, The Ring Goes East, without intercutting between Aragorn's adventure and Frodo's adventure. From the descriptions, it sounds like the 1955 production did the same thing, but every other adaptation I've experienced intercuts between the subplots or just eliminates one altogether. I've spoken in the past about how I'm okay with this as an adaptational choice, even though Tolkien wouldn't be. The narrative now divides into two main branches. One, prime action, the ring bearers. Two, subsidiary action, the rest of the company, leading to the heroic matter. It is essential that these two branches should be each treated in coherent sequence, both to render them intelligible as a story, and because they are totally different in tone and scenery. Jumbling them together entirely destroys these things. Look, I still disagree with him here, but I'm not going to tell a dead man he's wrong about his own story. So had he known that almost every adaptation going forward would jumble them together, he might have given the 55 production more credit for not doing that. And had he lived to hear the 79 production, he might have praised it as well for doing what I'm sure he thought was the bare minimum. This is one of very few adaptations to include Hanbury Han, just referred to as Wild Man, because I'm guessing they didn't know how to pronounce his name. I'm only 60% sure I know how. No, father of horsemen, we fight not, hunt only, kill orc folk in woods, hate orc folk, you hate them too. We help as can. Yorith is here, voiced by Pat Franklin, who also voices Mary, but she's never called Yorith, just old woman. Would that there were kings in Gonda, as there were once upon a time, they say. Why? For it said in old law, yes indeed, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And so the rightful king could ever be known. Men may long remember your words, old woman. Once again, I'm guessing this is because they didn't know how to pronounce Yorith. And we got a Bergil. Radio is where these minor Gondorians thrive. I'm Virgil, son of Beragon of the gods. I don't know who plays Beragil here, so I don't know if their career is as interesting as David Hemmings. I will bear you before me under my cloak. Such goodwill should not be denied. Say no more to any, but come. Thank you indeed. Thank you, sir, though I still do not know your name. Do you not? Then call me Dernhelm. The number of women who play male characters makes the fact that Mary doesn't immediately recognize Dernhelm as Eowyn a little more plausible, but the fact that he was just talking to Eowyn seconds ago as the audience hears it makes it way less plausible. For I will sing to you of Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. Hey, there's the Minstrel of Gondor, one year before Glenn Yarbrough played him. Since year one of Tolkien Adaptation Month, both Tolkien wikis corrected their mistaken categorization of him as a character who only appears in the Rankin Bass film. I don't know if that was corrected because of my video, but if so, you're welcome. I like this adaptation okay, and I'm glad that there is at least one complete Hobbit and Lord of the Rings adaptation that has a consistent through line. That is really nice that such a thing exists. And again, Unlike The Hobbit, this wasn't overshadowed by another production at its time of debut. This would take two years to be overshadowed by another production. Long years ago, in the second age of Middle-earth, the elven smiths of Eregion forged rings of great power. Yes, the 1981 BBC Lord of the Rings is considered by many to be the gold standard of radio Tolkien adaptations, and considered by some to be the gold standard of Tolkien adaptations in any medium. And Sauron was, for that time, vanquished. But at length, his dark shadow stretched forth once more, and he sought again for mastery over the rings of power. This is the longest radio adaptation yet, clocking in at over 12 hours, originally broadcast in 1981 in 26 half-hour episodes, then rebroadcast in 1982 in 13 hour-long episodes. I haven't found a re-release of the 1981 edit. The earliest release I found is of the 1982 edit, so I'm going off of the hour-long versions of the episodes for the purposes of this video. Famously, this production stars Ian Holm as Frodo, decades before he would play Bilbo on film, and it stars Peter Woodthorpe as Gollum and Michael Graham Cox as Boromir, 
after they had already played those roles on film. So it is the link between the Lord of the Rings cinematic universes. It's Lord of the Rings No Way There and Back Again. Also, a young Bill Nye plays Sam in this, decades before he would be a future Bilbo's boss. Hello, Nicholas. How's it happen? Still a bit stiff. Have we not gotten Steve Coogan into any Tolkien adaptations yet? That seems overdue. Nah, no, sit down, Gandalf. We'll have a sure. pipe of old Toby together. Uh -huh. Now you can tell me your news. Thank you, Bilbo. Uh, There's no pipe weed to compare with that of the Shire. I've missed it. Mm. As to news, well, that, for the moment, must wait. Michael Hordern is a great Gandalf, which is impressive considering he reportedly did not understand the story at all, and later called the role a bit of a slog doesn't show at all. He's great. This is probably the best documented radio adaptation of Tolkien, not only because the production itself has been released numerous times, but because the main fellow behind it seemingly never passes up a chance to tell stories about the production. Whether on his personal blog or in the Tolkien Society newsletter, this fellow has told tales. And who is this fellow, you ask? Why, it's Brian Sibley, of course. Sibley has written numerous radio plays, and he has written and edited countless books, including much later writing the official movie guide books for the Jackson Lord of the Rings and Hobbit trilogies, movies that just happen to be co-written by his distant cousin, Fran Walsh. And yes, he wrote one of the essays in this book, but not one that has anything to do with radio shows, so I'm not going to read it today. He's also written books about Disney history. Yes, he's written on Tolkien history and Disney history. He's like me, except he gets paid for it. On top of that, he personally worked with P.L. Travers in her lifetime on a potential script for a Mary Poppins sequel long before the actual Mary Poppins sequel, but that project was seemingly killed in the wake of the regime change to Eisner and Katzenberg. Maybe the bites just weren't quick enough for old Jeffrey. However, he did years later write a book about the making of the Mary Poppins stage musical, and he wrote additional screenplay material for The Wrong Trousers, and he wrote the books that compiled storyboards for both The Wrong Trousers and A Close Shave. I've had this book for years and never even realized it was him, but look, there he is. The guy who brought Tolkien to radio in its most famous iteration also wrote this book I love that's the storyboards for The Close Shave. This man officially has my dream career. Anyway, long before he accomplished most of that, Sibley was pitching radio programs to the BBC. Richard Emerson, head of the BBC script unit, asked if there was anything he'd like to adapt, and he said his pie-in-the-sky dream work would be Lord of the Rings, not knowing that the BBC was actively trying to develop a new Lord of the Rings radio program, presumably to wash the taste out of the 1955 production. The BBC was negotiating with Saul Zaints in secret to regain the radio rights, and only once negotiations were successful did everyone realize Zaints didn't even have control over the radio rights in the first place. That's enough, son. I'll buy it. While Tolkien was no longer alive to approve the scripts, Christopher Tolkien was, and he not only gave his notes, but he gave a tape recording of proper pronunciations. This only went so far, apparently. But Isildur, Elendil's son, cut the ring from Sauron's hand. Isildur took it. That is tidings indeed. Isildur took it, Boromir. Sibley was given the job, but due to his inexperience, he was paired with Michael Bakewell, who had previously adapted War and Peace to radio. But the task of breaking the story into episodes fell to Sibley, who was later made aware of Tolkien's opinions regarding interweaving the plot threads, but he had already come to the conclusion that there was no other way to properly dramatize the story. Sibley later wrote in Malorn, the Tolkien Society's annual journal, that... If the serial had followed the format of the book, it would have been little short of a dramatic and artistic catastrophe. I don't know if he was oblivious to the earlier radio adaptations that did follow the format of the book, or if he was keenly aware of them and throwing some shade. So does it just present the story in chronological order? Not quite. There's some flash forwards and flashbacks throughout. Now, however, Bilbo was no longer the occupant of Bag End and sinister shadows lengthened in the Shire. But let us go back 17 years to an evening in early September when the chief topic of conversation at the Ivy Bush Tavern in Hobbiton was Mr. Bilbo Baggins. But more of the story is presented in chronological order than not, so the listener doesn't have to wonder why Gandalf was delayed. I have come for your aid, Saruman the White. Have you indeed, Gandalf the Grey? For aid? 
It has seldom been heard of that Gandalf the Grey sought for aid. One so cunning and so wise. Wandering about the lands and concerning himself in every business, whether it belonged to him or not. Ooh, now this is a Saruman. Peter Howell really brings a mellifluousness that conveys the persuasive magic of Saruman's voice with just a hint of a sinister undertone. But because of Radagast, Gwaihir the Windlord has come to me in my darkest hour. No mortal tames the eagles of the mountains, not even Radagast or Gandalf. So tell weirdos on the internet to shut up about us taking you to Mordor already. Also, this might be the only adaptation where Gandalf taking shadow facts from Theoden is actually dramatized and not just described off-camera, making this adaptation one where Theoden appears in all three volumes. Hail Theoden, son of Thengel. Why comes Gandalf the Grey unlooked for to my halls? I have come to seek the aid of the Rohirrim and their king. I have never heard before that Gandalf sought the aid of any man. This production does not include every single song from the books, but it retains more of them than, honestly, a lot of them do. And I think this is the only radio production to actually put The Road Goes Ever On to music. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can. All the other English language radio productions just have it recited. Roads go ever, ever on, under cloud and under star. Yet feet that wandering have gone turn at last to home afar. But only Bilbo sings it. Frodo still just recites it. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Music is also used creatively to tell the story of the Battle of Pelennor Fields. It was a great battle, afterwards told in many a song, in the feast hall of Medusal. He heard of the horns in the hills ringing, a sword shining in the south kingdom. It's hard to convey large-scale battles in audio, so this choice was an interesting way to get it across without just having it described in narration. Fired in a forest, they drove through the foreman, filled and Fangled son, where the press was thickest, shivered his spear as he struck down the sun. I've heard some people criticize this choice as being a strange stylistic departure this late into the series, or creating too much distance between the listener and the battle. But honestly, I think making it operatic contributes to the feeling that this is an ancient mythology, which of course is what Tolkien was going for. There are some really creative flourishes in this. I like this device that the presence of the Black Riders and the Temptation of the Ring is signaled with this Chanting of the Rings poem. Hush, one ring to rule them all. One ring to find them all. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bind them. I feel like that might have influenced Jackson's choice to give the ring a whispering voice. <laughs> Unlike the 79 production, this version keeps the full weight of the maggot exchange. That farmer maggot remembers young Frodo and forgives him, and that Frodo laments the loss of this potential friendship. We'll hear anything on the road long before we meet it. You know, farmer maggot, I've been in terror of you and your dogs for over 30 years, though you may laugh to hear it. It's a pity, for I've missed a good friend. Well, you should never have gone getting yourself mixed up with Hobbit and folk. So, this is officially my favorite Farmer Maggot adaptation. Just barely edging out the inexplicable Soviet innkeeper. So the only safe thing to do is to go off in a quite unexpected direction. Then we must go through the old forest and then on to Bree. So the Hobbits do go through the old forest, but nothing particularly noteworthy happened there, as far as the listener knows. Is there anywhere there we can stay? Uh, there's an inn, Frodo. The Prancing Pony, if I remember rightly. Without Bombadil to send them there, the choice to stay at the Prancing Pony just amounts to Frodo resigning to inns not making quite as long delays as sleeping outside does. I am going to war, Master Meriadoc. I release you from my service, but not from my friendship. You shall abide in Dunharrow, if you will, and serve the Lady Erwin. But I won't be left behind to be called for and return. I won't be left, I won't. 
I will bear you before me under my cloak until we are far afield, and this darkness is yet darker. Such good will should not be denied. Oh, thank you indeed. Thank you, sir, though I do not know your name. Do you not? And since you've got your visor down, I cannot see your face begging your pardon, sir. Then call me Dernhelm. Okay, this time Mary should absolutely have recognized Eowyn's voice. It grieves me, Master Gandalf, that our leechcraft cannot withstand this evil. Evil indeed it is, Yorith. <sighs> we get Yorith, played by Pauline Letts. No Bear Guild this time, though. This story is no place for children. Also, we don't even have Baragond, so of course we're not going to have his kid. Let the minstrel sing to us. <sighs> now listen to my lay. For I will sing to you of Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. The Minstrel of Gondor's here too. Man, those past wiki editors really dropped the ball if they thought this guy was just from the Rankin Bass cartoon. Frodo went forth on a fateful journey. We don't hear the full version of the song here, but uh, from what snippet we do hear, I have a hunch that this won't use the Ring of Doom, Cave of Gloom rhyme nearly as often as Glenn did. Cave of Gloom. Ring of doom, ring of doom, cave of gloom. This production is pretty great. It's beloved for good reason. And unlike the two Hobbit radio productions, I think this and the Mind's Eye Lord of the Rings have distinct enough takes on it that I can appreciate both of them separately. This one, I think, is definitely the better dramatization of Lord of the Rings, but uh, I can't really gauge which one is the better adaptation because... You know, the Mind's Eye production is the more direct, faithful adaptation, but this one definitely does the more interesting things with it. But yes, this production is considered by most to be the definitive Lord of the Rings radio adaptation, if not the definitive Lord of the Rings adaptation altogether. And it's been released on home media many times, including a special re-release in 2002 in the wake of the films, where instead of being presented as the episodes originally aired, they were re-edited to be more like the books, re-edited to be in three volumes with a new framing device where they brought Ian Holm back as Frodo after he had already played Bilbo. The road goes ever on and on. <laughs> Oh, now Frodo sings it. A little bit. Oh, so many pages left blank. Almost as if Bilbo knew that the story which he began would one day have to be finished by someone else. I've left them for you, Frodo, my lad, he used to say. It is so surreal to hear the voice that I'm used to as Bilbo, but playing the part of Frodo imitating Bilbo. You're singing it now. Impressive. All Bilbo's titles set down one after another. Crossed out one after another. My diary. Dull. <laughs> My unexpected journey. Better. There and back again. Good. Uh, added later and what happened after, except that even that didn't satisfy you, did it, Bilbo? Crossed through like all the others. Obviously, the perfect title for this story is Hobbitit. How could I have known where the road would lead when I set out from Hobbiton with the ring? Or how could we have known when the Fellowship of the Ring left the safe haven of Rivendell? What terrible perils would befall us? This framing device is used as a bookend, opening and closing Fellowship and Two Towers, and opening Return of the King. <sighs> Night's drawing on. And the telling of this tale draws towards its dark conclusion. In those final days, as the storm clouds of war gathered and grew heavy, doom and dread were closing in upon us all. Obviously, Frodo doesn't come back to close Return of the King because uh, he's already sailing away. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved. But not for me. This 2002 edit runs into the same issue that the Jackson movies do. Telling the stories chronologically does not line up with the division of the trilogy in text. Rather than take the movie's approach of chopping off the end of book four and adding it to volume three, 
This chops off the beginning of Book 5 and adds it to Volume 2. So Return of the King begins with the Samwise the Strong Temptation, which I love. Samwise the Strong, hero of the age, armies flocking to my call, marching to the overthrow of Barad-dûr. What are you thinking about, Sam? You're no hero. A gardener. That's what you were meant to be. But the first bit of Book 5 we hear in Volume 3 is Denethor awaiting Faramir's return from Osgiliath. In Gondor, the lord of the city sat in a high chamber above the hall of the White Tower with Pippin at his side. Again, I disagree with Tolkien that the subplots need to be presented in the order they are in the book, but keeping things in the order they are in the book is seemingly the only way to keep the titles of the volumes faithful. And that was the most beloved radio adaptation of Tolkien. But as beloved as it was, Brian Sibley kept getting one question over and over. Why did you cut Bombadil? Never mind the fact that most adapters cut Bombadil, and never mind the fact that he also cut Gildor and Quickbeam and Baragond and Imrahil and others, people only asked about Bombadil. So eventually, Sibley decided it was time to bring Bombadil's story to the radio as well, as part of a new series of Tolkien adaptations called Tales from the Perilous Realm. This was broadcast in 1992, and most of the episodes were adaptations of non-Middle-Earth stories of Tolkien, so while they are technically Tolkien adaptations and I could cover them, I know they're not actually what most of you are here for, so I'm not going to talk about the other episodes. Well, okay, I will say one thing about one of them, Brian Blessed plays Farmer Giles of Ham. My name in full is Agidius Ahenobarbus Julius Agricola de Hamo. But as there was more time in those days, I'm simply going to call him Farmer Giles. I love it, no notes. But two of the episodes, airing on September 6th and 13th of 1992, were called The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. This was something of a misnomer because these weren't actually based on the poem The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. Although, if you want to hear an audio version of that poem, Tolkien himself read it, so there you go. Old Tom Bombadil was a merry fellow. Bright blue his jacket was and his boots were yellow. This, on the other hand, takes its name from the poem, but it's just an adaptation of the Bombadil episode of the text. <sighs> it's dark and damp. Are the stories about this place true, Mary? If you mean the old bogey stories about goblins and wolves and things of that sort, I should say no. But the forest is queer. Now this in theory could be slid right in where the chapters were deleted in Sibley's earlier radio program, even though the Hobbits are voiced by completely different actors here. But there are two returning cast members, playing different roles. John Church, who previously played Gaffer Gamgee, now plays Old Man Willow. And Michael Hordern, who previously played Gandalf, now plays Tolkien himself. As the heroes of this tale discover when they find themselves caught up in the adventures of Tom Bombadil. It's a pretty solid Tolkien imitation. Better than either of the Soviet Tolkiens. Not bad for someone who didn't really understand his work. We'd better be ready to face some new danger. Doesn't sound dangerous. It just sounds nonsense. Bombadil is played by Ian Hogg, and he is good, but come on, Brian Blessed was right there. You know who I am? I'm Tom Bombadil! <laughs> Tell me, what's your trouble? Tom's in a hurry now. One of the reasons Sibley cut it from the main broadcast was it felt like too long a respite from the threat of the Black Riders. But if you're turning it into its own story, you really got to amp up the conflict in what is otherwise the safest stretch of the story. So this plays up the couple of moments of peril in the house of Tom Bombadil. Frodo, in a dream without light. A noise like a strong wind blowing, and on it was born the sound of hoofs galloping, galloping, galloping from the east. Ah, oh, riders! Black riders! The nightmares the hobbits have on their first night are played pretty well. Pippin, dreaming that he hears in the darkness, branches fretting in the wind. Twig fingers scraping wall and window. 
And Bombadil tells some of his own tale, which actually does draw from the poem, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. So that's a snippet of an actual adaptation of the poem within an in-name only adaptation of the poem, like all those movies that claim to be based on the Raven. Moving constantly in and out of his talk was old man Willow, whose heart was rotten, but whose strength was green. And this story involves being trapped by old man Willow, so, you know, even Bombadil's in danger. Ha! <sighs> Tom Bombadil. What be you a-thinking? Peeping inside my tree? Watching me a-drinking? And the incident where Bombadil takes the ring is played... pretty sinisterly. First off, this version of Bombadil seems to regard the importance of the quest a little more than he does in the text. Tom already knows something of your quest and of the perils which you face. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord on his dark throne in, in the, the land, land of Mordor, Mordor where, where the, the shadows, shadows lie. He seems more aware of the weight of the quest, but he still treats the ring itself just as frivolously. It's vanished! The ring! <laughs> now, merry doll! No need to look suspicious. Here's the ring, returned, unchanged. It casts an extra layer of doubt on how much Bombadil can be trusted, but it works because it's from the perspective of Frodo, who is under just enough of the ring's thrall to especially distrust anyone else with it. <laughs> What's the matter, Frodo? Annoyed with old Tom? <laughs> Something so perilous should not be treated lightly. Frodo's internal conflict here seems to be portrayed by Frodo arguing with Tolkien in his mind. Is it the same ring? It looks the same. It weighs the same. Or maybe his conscience takes the voice of Gandalf? They can't see me. There's a seeing look in old Tom's eyes. I'm invisible. It's my ring, all right. It's the ring, the one ring. Then, of course, there's the main source of peril from the text, the Barrow Downs. Where are you? I am waiting for you. No. Oh. Tall, like a shadow against the sky, leaning over me. Eyes, cold. I see touch. Strong, colder than iron. Yeah, it's good and creepy. And Tom comes to the rescue, casting aside any lingering distrust we may feel of him, and he guides them through the rest of the forest. Whoa there, my hearties. There, ahead. The road you must travel. The road goes ever on and on. Down from the door where it began. Now far ahead, the road has gone, and I must follow if I can. Well, we're back to a non-musical road goes ever on, I guess. Old Bilbo used to say, It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out of your door. Yeah, you already said that in the previous radio show. Well, Ian Holm, as you said it. I'm sorry to take leave of Master Bombadil. Yes. He's a caution and no mistake. <laughs> I reckon we may go a good deal further and see naught better, nor queerer. <laughs> <laughs> While it takes a few minor creative liberties with presentation, it's mostly a fairly faithful adaptation of the Bombadil chapters in the text that can be sought out if you like Bombadil and ignored if you don't. It's like the audio equivalent of if Jackson had made a Bombadil short film for the DVDs. 11 years later with different actors. So it's cool that it's here for the people whose primary complaint about the 1981 production was the lack of Bombadil. Now throw a bone for the Imrahil Hive, okay? At your service. And those are the other English language radio plays based on Middle Earth, at least that I'm aware of. If I missed any, let me know in the comments. I will maybe cover them in the future. But next week, we'll be listening to something else inspired by Middle Earth. We're going to be playing some tunes. But in the meantime, what do you think of these radio productions? Do you have a favorite out of them? Do you have a least favorite? Let's discuss this all in the comments. And until next week, this is Dave, signing off. <laughs>